we have been uh, uh, studying through a, just a critically important part of the book of Philippians. There's just a, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. And in it, he, he, in this little part that we've been looking at the last two or three weeks, he's been talking about how there is one thing that is worth him giving everything else up for. And the thing is, is he speaks with credibility because he actually did give up so much. He gave up his high position in society, his money, his relationships, his accomplishments, even his physical security. Paul gave that up for this one thing that became to him more important than anything else. And, and that one thing was knowing Jesus. To know Jesus. Jesus uh, Paul said... To know Jesus is worth giving up. Every, he said, I count everything as worthless for the sake of knowing Jesus, my Lord, for having a personal relationship with Jesus. Paul says, I want to know Jesus' power in my life. I want to experience Jesus' power in my life. He says, I want to even experience Jesus' sufferings in my life. Not that he just wanted to suffer, but, but he, he knew that following Jesus would lead him into times that were really difficult, that would involve suffering. He says, you know, I embrace those times because when I am struggling for the sake of Jesus, it just draws me near to him. I come to know him better. I depend on him more. And he, his life just, just lives through me, even, even through those sufferings. Paul just passionately wanted to know Jesus better and better. And, and he said, you know, the, the most important thing in my life that has happened to me is, is me coming to know Jesus. And he says, but that is also what I look forward to because there is coming a day when I will see him, I will be with him, face to face, there won't be anything, uh, any barrier between me and Jesus, and I just look forward to that day, and I aim for that day. He said, I'm, I'm like a runner in a race. I'm just straining toward what's ahead, forgetting what's behind, uh, not worrying about all the distractions around me, and I'm straining toward the finish line so that I, where I can know Jesus in all his fullness. Oh, he says, that is what I'm looking forward to. But, but Paul knew, Paul knew that the, the Christians that he was writing to the, the church in, in Philippi, that not all of them would really get what he was saying. That they wouldn't all just kind of, you know, just understand, oh, okay, knowing Jesus is so awesome that they might not connect with that. Uh, maybe, like, you might empathize with that. You know, as we've been talking about how important knowing Jesus is, you, you might have been thinking, maybe even a little subconsciously, well, you know, I, I, that sounds... Weird to me. I mean, you know, I, I don't really understand why knowing Jesus is such this drastically important thing and why the point of my life and what I should be living for is to know Jesus. I mean, how, how do I, you know, intimately even know somebody that I can't see? You know, I just don't, I just don't get that. I'm just not, not there. And Paul, Paul knew that some of those that he'd be writing to, maybe many of them, really wouldn't, wouldn't be at that point where they would just totally grasp that yet. And so, so he... He allows for that. He, 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 he speaks to that. And so we pick up in uh, verse 15 of chapter 3 where Paul says this. It says, All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Paul realized we're not at this, all at the same level of spiritual maturity, okay? Um, not, not everyone is, is at the point where they just realize how awesome and wonderful it is to know Jesus and to make Jesus known, to, to center their lives on Him, and, and they're just, just not, not there yet. And Paul knew that, hey, we're all at different levels of spiritual maturity. And there's not a single one of us that has reached, that has arrived, you know, that has reached the point of ultimate spiritual maturity, that we're there yet. Even Paul himself said, you know, it's not that I've completed this, not that I've been made perfect, I'm not there yet either, but I just press on to know him. And so, so all, all of us were at different levels of spiritual maturity, and Paul knew that, but he also knew that wherever we're at, that we can grow to maturity, that we can grow to a faith that is truly life-changing, that truly is a, is a knowing Jesus that fulfills us and gives us life and gives us energy, gives us eternity. And so, so Paul's like, you know, you, you may not be there yet, but God's going to make it clear to you. God, God's going to take you there. But then he adds a condition, okay? 
Yes, God is going to take you there. God is going to grow you to maturity. But something has to be true about you. Something has to be true in your life for God to do that. And this is what it is. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. If God is going to deepen your understanding, deepen your experience of Jesus, you need to first live out what you already know. Paul's writing to believers. He's not writing to non-Christians here. He's writing to Christians, okay? And so all of these people he's writing to have had some experience of Jesus. They have known uh, and believed the gospel of Jesus. They believe that Jesus has, has come and has died for them and, and that they are to, to, to live for him and they, they are to follow him. They know some of Jesus' teachings, you know, you know, ways that they are to live, ways that they are not to live. You know, they, they know some basic things. They don't know it all, but they know, at least know a little bit about Jesus and about what it is to follow him. They, they realize that, hey, you know, there are certain things I need to put to practice in my life so that I can learn to love God and love people. They know that that's the two greatest commandments, love God, love people. They, they get those kind of basic things. But before they can grow past their current understanding, they need to actually do what they already know. Because, as you know, there's a huge difference between knowing what you should do and actually, actually doing it, right? I can't remember if I've told you this story before, but uh, this is over a year ago, and uh, this is the, the moment where we realized, me and Aaron realized, that we were in deep trouble as parents, okay? We were, we were in, in deep caboodle. Um, it, was, it was early afternoon, mid-afternoon, and uh, Lydia who was then two, okay, uh, she broke one of Ben's toys. And Ben, being Ben, just burst into tears, and he was just, it was just awful, you know, there's the worst thing possible that had happened. And so, Aaron, I was at work, okay, Aaron, you know, gets on to Lydia, you know, you know Lydia, you know, you, that was wrong. You hurt his toy. You don't want other people to do that to your toy. She gave him that whole thing, you know. Now, you go tell Ben that you're sorry. And at that, Lydia's like, Lydia, you tell Ben that you're sorry. You broke his toy. You go tell him you're sorry. This went on for a little while. Finally, Lydia got herself a spanking. Lydia, you go tell Ben that you're sorry. Now she's in tears. Now she's crying. But she's not budging. No. So Aaron not knowing exactly what to do at this point, says, you go up to your room and sit on your bed and you will be in your bed until you decide to tell Ben you're sorry. So, took Lydia to her room, set her on her bed, and you are there until you tell Ben you're sorry. Now, weirdly enough, she actually obeyed staying in her room and on her bed. Okay, that part, she, I don't know what, but anyway, uh, so she stayed in her bed and she bawled. She bawled. Every few minutes, Aaron would go in. Okay, Lydia, are you ready to come out of your room? Okay. Let's go tell Ben that you're sorry. <laughs> Doing it. Aaron calls me at work. Tells me what's going on. Okay, so, so then, then before, before I get home from, from work, she calls me again and says, okay, Lydia's been up there for almost two hours. She has been crying the whole time. But she will not tell Ben that she's sorry. So I, I, I come home, you know, it's 5 o'clock, you know, I, I come home, and, and I think this is going to go pretty well. Because, you know, I'm, I'm coming in from the outside. I'm dad. I give her the look. She's going to, she, you know, she's going to get it, okay? She's going to be okay. So I, so I come in. I'm going to be the nice guy. I come in. Hi, hey, Lydia. Hey, you've been crying. Yeah. I, I heard that you broke Ben's toy. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, let's go tell Ben that you're sorry, and then you can get out of your room, okay? Let's go tell him you're sorry. And she, she stopped crying, and she looked at me like, I want to get out of my room. I ain't doing it. It's like, Lydia, you're going to sit on your bed until you tell Ben you're sorry. So I, I start coming back about every 15 minutes. She's, she cries the whole time, you know, that, that we're gone. So I, I, every 15 minutes, are you ready to get out of your room? Tell Ben you're sorry. Supper's ready, okay? Lydia, are you hungry? 
Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Let's 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 go down and let's eat. You just got to tell Ben you're sorry. No, she would not do it. We go. We eat our supper. I I I'd bring food. Do you want this food? <laughs> just tell Ben that you're sorry. She's not doing it. We ate our supper, we cleaned up, we saved a little plate for her for when we figured she was ultimately going to give in and eat food. I'm telling you, that girl went to bed that night without supper, never left her bed, would not tell Ben that she was sorry. Me and Aaron are looking at each other. What are we going to do? We have never experienced this before. Wow, how are we going to handle this? So I was like, okay, what do we do in the morning? Let's just, let's just start fresh in the morning, okay? In the morning, start fresh, start new. We're not going to even refer to it, and, and we're going to let it go, and just, just this comes up again, then we'll, we'll just deal with it. So here we go. Fortunately, this did not come up again. About a week and a half later, Lydia is riding the, in the car with, with Aaron. I think, I think the other kids were there too. And they're just riding in the car, and she goes, Mommy, I'm sorry, I broke Ben's toy. (laughs) Now, it took her 10 days (laughs) of pondering on that thought. But she finally did that. Now, I want to tell you, that was an incredible relief for us. Now, we know we've got these in our future. We know our daughter. We know this is going to happen. But but now, she she says sorry very easily. She'll, She'll say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. In fact, she says it so easily it's almost a little glib, get out of jail free card, okay? I walk into the bathroom, she's pumping gobs of hand soap into her hand. I give her a look, and she goes, I'm ah, sorry. <laughs> now, at first, this was very cute. Oh, she's, you know, she's actually like, sorry, she's giving this, this is very nice. After a while, it's like, okay, she's playing us here. You know, and so, so you know, I go in, Hope is screaming. She's screaming. I go, go into their room, Lydia's got her by the hair. And I say, Lydia. And she goes, oh, I'm sorry, it's okay now. Because <laughs> that's going to make everything all, all, all better. So, so now we're to the point where it's like, okay, we're, we're, we're glad you're sorry. We're glad you're sorry, that's good. But you need to stop doing wrong. You need to stop doing what you know is wrong. Stop doing that, okay? And so because we're, we're trying to teach her, okay, yes, you're sorry, that's good, but you need to actually change what you're doing, okay? We need, need you to actually do something different because it's, it's so much easier to know what you're supposed to do, even be sorry for not doing what you're supposed to do, than it is to actually do it. Um, I, I used to, years ago, used to know this, this old lady at church. And um, she, she knew the Bible like nothing. She spouted, you would be in a normal conversation with her, and she'd just start quoting the Bible, okay? It's like weird. It was very strange. It was, she, she, just, she, just, she just, she just, Bible verses just, just, just came out of her. Okay. She was perhaps the most unpleasant person I've ever known. I mean, just kind of mean, just kind of just, just generally unkind, just, you know, it was, it, was, it was so odd. You're saying Bible verses all the time, but something's not soaking in. You know, what is this? This is just a weird, odd kind of combination. It is so much easier to know what it is that you're supposed to do than it, than it is to actually live it out, to actually live out what it is that you know. I would imagine that in, in, a, in a group this size, that there are a lot of us with a pretty, well, let's just say a pretty surface level faith. And by that, I, I mean, you believe in Jesus, you want to go to heaven, uh, you want to you know, try to be a good person. But when we start talking about you know, laying down your life for Jesus, we start talking about centering your entire life around knowing Jesus and making him known, about passionately loving God and loving the people around you, and, and, and you know, just giving your life to him, surrendering your life to him. You start hearing that stuff, and it just kind of just doesn't kind of really sink in. It just, just seems a little over the top, seems a little overly, overly spiritual, you know? It's like, uh, you're just not there yet. And the truth is, is that we all have different levels, different degrees of spiritual maturity. So the question is not how mature I am. This is, this is important, okay? The question is not how 
mature I am spiritually. The question is, am I able to move beyond, to grow beyond the spiritual maturity that I am right now? Am I growing? Am I changing? Am I becoming more like Jesus? Am I able to grow past the point that I am right now? And the answer to that question depends on this question. Am I living out what I already know to be true? Am I living out what God has already taught me, what he has already showed me? Because if I'm not, then I have reached the limit of my growth. I cannot continue to grow spiritually if I am unwilling to actually practice in my life what I already know, what God has already shown me. I must live what I know before I can grow. I know that's kind of weird sing-songy rhyme okay? But hopefully it'll help us to, to remember that. I must live what I know before I can grow. I must begin to live out what I've already been taught, what I've already been shown for me to grow further. There, there may be right now a, a barrier, some kind of barrier that prevents you from growing in your love for God, for growing in your experience of Jesus, in your experience of living out God's will for your life, of, of, of experiencing God's mission for your life, that there may be a barrier that keeps that from happening. And it may be, it may be a sin that, that you haven't been willing to leave behind. Maybe a sin that, that has hung around and, and you, you know it shouldn't be there and you don't want it to be there, but it's kind of got its tentacles in you pretty deeply and it's just, well, it's going to take a lot of God's grace and more than a half-hearted attempt on your part to do really something about it. Um, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a sexual sin. Uh, maybe maybe you use uh, pornography, and so you know you you uh, exploit some man or woman that you don't even know uh, for your own own purposes, and it's it's eating at you, and it's eating eating you. Maybe maybe you are maybe you're sleeping with somebody that you're not married to, and it's not that you don't think it's right. it's not that you don't know it's wrong. You know it's wrong. I mean, you, you already know that. You don't need somebody to lecture you on you shouldn't do that. You don't, and that is wrong. You know it's wrong, but, but that's the problem. That's the problem because you know what God desires of you, and you're rejecting that. And as long as you're rejecting what you already know, there's no way that you're going to be able to grow from here. That's going to continue to be a barrier that prevents you from being able to grow. Maybe it's something like gossip. That's kind of light. That's kind of no big deal, right? You find yourself saying things like, well, I probably shouldn't say this, but... Or, not that it's any of my business, but... And really, you know that you should stop before but and just not say anything more, right? Because you know, you know, you already know, you know that oh, I shouldn't be talking about people that way. And, and I want you to know that not only does, does doing that, does talking about people, not only does that destroy others, does that damage other people, but you are creating a barrier that is going to be impossible for you to continue to grow closer to God, to experience Jesus, to experience God's will for your life, unless you stop doing that. You're not going to have any peace until you stop doing that which you know to be wrong. Maybe, maybe you have hurt somebody perhaps through your anger, Maybe you've said things to somebody or done things to somebody, uh, perhaps out of anger, and you have justified it in your own mind, hey, you know, they, they deserve that in some way, or it's really not my fault because this happened, this, and I was just kind of, you know, it, but the fact is, is you hurt somebody, you damage somebody, and that's still there, and you know it, and you're not going to have any peace 
until you deal with it and until you try to make it right, it's going to be a barrier that's going to keep you from being able to grow until you deal with that sin that, is, that you're allowing to continue to be there. On the other hand, you may be on the other end of that. Maybe somebody has hurt you. Maybe somebody has hurt you severely. Maybe you have been abused in some way, sexually, physically, in, in some other way. Someone has, has just truly damaged your heart. Someone that you love has turned their back on you, has abandoned you. Maybe somebody has made your past or your present just it seems like a, really a living hell. And the teaching of Jesus that really bothers you most is when he says this. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And that is very, very hard for you to hear because you're hanging on to that bitterness. Joanne Weaver said, bitterness is like drinking poison and waiting for the other person to die. And it really is. You can be bitter, you can stay bitter, but the only thing that it will, the only person it will damage is you. So are you going to let what somebody else did mess up what God has for you and the plans that God has for you? Disobedience comes in, in many forms. Perhaps it's not some sin that you need to stop doing. Perhaps it's something that you know that you need to start doing. Something that you, need, you know you need to put in your life. And something maybe that, that God has just been kind of reminding you of and planning in your heart over and over and over, but, but you just, just haven't been able to step out in faith and actually do it. How many of you, you don't need to raise your hand, but how many of you sense a need in your life to reorder your priorities. I mean, you're, 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 you're really busy doing some things. And, and, and perhaps they're good things, not, not necessarily bad things, but you are, you are, you're just so, your time and your energy and your money is so spent doing those things that, that while maybe fine, but don't have a lot of eternal value, that when God puts on your heart to do something that that really counts, that, that can have an eternal impact. You just really can't. You, you, don't, you don't have time. You don't have the energy. You don't have the money. You, you're just not able to commit yourself to, to doing what God is, is, is calling you to do because your life is so, so full. It's so, it's so packed with things. Maybe, a, maybe some time, for some time, God has kind of been knocking on the door, inviting you, to serve in some way. Maybe he's calling you to make, if you have a family, maybe he's calling you to make changes in your, in your family life, to help your family be more, more spiritually focused, to help your kids to be able to really see Jesus and, and experience what it's like to, to really follow him. Maybe there's just that little divine tug on you. There's somebody in your life that is lost. Somebody in your life is struggling, and, and, and you God is just tugging on you to, to share your faith with that person. Maybe God keeps showing you people who have physical needs. Maybe you've been filling your life with so much stuff that you've just neglected spending time alone with God. That you've just neglected building a relationship with Him through prayer, uh, through Scripture, through just uh, solitude of being with God. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you probably, probably know what it is. And it keeps coming up. And God keeps planting that in your heart, keeps planting that in your head, and you keep pushing it aside. You need to know, God's not going to keep doing that. He's not going to keep reminding you. He's not going to keep asking you. He's not going to keep inviting you. If you keep on justifying, you keep on making excuses, you keep on putting everything else above Him, then ultimately He's going to allow you to keep your shallow, skin-deep faith. He'll let you have it. But is that what you really want? It takes guts. 
And it takes trust to come to God and sincerely say, God, I am yours. Whatever you want, I'll do it. Whatever the need is, whatever you desire, I'll do it. I'm yours. I'll mess up. I'll stumble. I'll fall. I'll make mistakes. I'll be an idiot. And, but I'm going to get back up and I'm going to keep doing what you asked me to do. I'm going to keep following you. I'll not make excuses. I will make steps of faith. And I know that whatever you have planned for me is greater than whatever I could come up with on my own. When you and I seek God's will, commit to following it wherever it takes us, we tear down all those barriers that keep us from growing, that keep us from experiencing life with Jesus, that keeps us from experiencing real life, both now and forever. I must live what I know before I can grow. Let's pray. Dear Father, you have shown us so much. And God, I know you want to show us so much more. You want to reveal to us so much more life. You want to, to help us to be able to just dive into the, to your joy, to your love, to your richness, peace, to your life. And I know, God, that you just want to do that in us. And you're just waiting for us to be faithful with what you've already shown us. Dear God, please help us, help me, help us to be faithful with what you have shown us, to seek, to, to begin to live out. God, as imperfectly as we might do it, as falteringly as we might do it, that we will start living out what it is that you have shown us to be true so that we can keep growing, so that we can keep experiencing deeper and richer and better life with you. Do that work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. If you, uh, if you want to, to talk with someone about, about, a, about a struggle that you're having, about something that you're dealing with, if you want to pray with someone, our elders are going to be in the back. They, they want to, to talk with you and pray with you. That We have some, some very good, godly men who themselves, just like me, are imperfect and we struggle with things, but who care about you, who have devoted their lives to caring for others. And, and, and they, they really do want you to share what, what, you're, what you need and to pray for you. If you want to become a Christian, we want to make that open to you and just let them know. We're going we're gonna to sing together. We're going to worship together. Let's stand while we do that.